Okay, good. All righty. So let's um, let's get going. And so we're going to record this as well. So um, we can actually send this out to people who aren't able to make the session this evening. Um, so welcome everybody to uh, business buying uh, in 2021. So we're going to be talking today for the next hour or so, um, depending on, on people's questions, uh, all the various uh, strategies, techniques, trends, insights that are currently out there in the market in 2021 around acquisition, entrepreneurship, buying and selling businesses. Uh, all your questions um, answered really um, so that we can kind of talk about uh, the various opportunities that we're seeing. And also we'll get into today uh, some of the things that we are personally involved in, some of the sectors, some of the industries, some of the tactics and strategies that we are deploying uh, as acquisition entrepreneurs ourselves. So just as a quick introduction, and we probably will do this a few times as people start to come in. Uh, my name is Nick Bradley. I know a lot of you have um, been listening to my podcast, Scale Up Your Business, uh, for some time. Uh, for those of you who have not uh, met me before, um, I have spent over a decade uh, working in private equity and and venture capital. Um, I used to go into companies that were undervalued, underleveraged um, by private equity and effectively fix them, turn them around and scale them. I've been personally involved in over 117 acquisitions. Um, some of them also in my corporate career back in the media days and 24 business exits. Uh, these days I have a portfolio of companies um, and I help uh, business owners scale predominantly through acquisitions uh, with the intent of creating value through acquisitions with, with um, their companies so that they can exit which is called a capital event or a liquidity event, which quite often is life-changing money for people. So what we're going to go through today is a set all the strategies around those various concepts. So Rob, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you very much, Nick. Um, Rob Williams, um, I'm Nick Bradley's business partner in the building group and scale up your business. Uh, my background started off as a, uh, a business partner, business owner um, in recruitment um, and sold that business in my early 20s. Uh, and um, ended up as a result of that becoming an angel investor myself and working with founders, helping them scale their, their, their business and, and maximize their value. Uh, I also work for a very large private equity firm in the UK that specialized in um, business process outsourcing and services business and made 30 acquisitions over a five year period. So I understood very quickly that there is a system to being able to target, identify, engage, and, um, and actually oversee an M&A transaction using other people's money because we want to maintain as much liquidity as possible in private equity. Um, and that this is something that could apply to any individual who owns a business or any individual looking for alternative means of, uh, of investment vehicles. Um, so yeah, really looking forward to the conversation today on acquisition entrepreneurship, how you get involved, what's happening in the market at the moment, and, and some of the technical details behind how you do, in fact, buy businesses with other people's money. And, and great to be here alongside you, Nick and Dennis. All righty. Thank you, Rob. And Dennis, do you want to do a quick intro of yourself, please? Absolutely. Uh, good morning. Good evening. I hope everyone is doing well. Thanks so much for inviting me over. Um, I'm a, uh, my name is Dennis Majorski, and I am an M&A advisor. I help clients buy, sell, and value businesses. I started my career at two, in 2005 when I bought my first company. I've uh, grown the company through several acquisitions and exited, and now I, I advise buyers and sellers on ways of buying and selling companies and value. Thanks for having me. Okay, excellent. We've got a few more people joining us here. So the way this is going to run today, everybody, as I said, we're going to um, talk about the state of the market and talk about some of the things that we are seeing. Uh, but a lot of it is about your questions. So um, if you do have questions, please feel free to put them into the chat. Uh, if you would like to actually join live and ask a question live, we will do that as well, um, which has work out how to do that, Rob. <laughs> I think people have to raise their hands so we can yeah. check for that. Um, but what I will also do today is I'm going to go through um, some of the basic steps, uh, processes, if you like, around how to effectively um, do small business acquisitions, just so you can understand some of the, some of the nuances, particularly things about you know, how do you work out what is the right deal for you uh, which is really the starting point, you know, working in this in this kind of let's call it industry and opportunity. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about deal sourcing, uh, and we'll talk about financing, uh, and then we will also cover what we call post acquisition scale up. So if anyone here is a business owner, and you are just interested in in how to scale your business effectively, some of the points and principles 
that underpin that will be applicable to you as well. Okay, so let's kick off. Dennis, I'm going to just um, talk to you about the market, if you like. So you're representing a number of business owners who are looking to sell. Um, you're based uh, in uh, sort of Northeast USA. Yep. What's the market looking like right now? What have you seen over the last, let's say, three to six months, particularly as the world is starting to come out of lockdown uh, and obviously post, post-pandemic? Yeah, there, there's so much going on. Uh, in the market right now. I mean, we're during the COVID, we kind of everything kind of slowed down, came to a halt. But right now, just the activity level is off the chart um, from all, all different directions. Uh, you know, you have the baby boomers who are retiring. They're looking for strategies and how to exit, how to sell their companies. You you have uh, um, capital gain taxes that are going to be most likely going to be heading um uh, this, the United States starting next year, most likely. So there's so much happening uh, in the world of acquisition that a typical small or mid-sized company, there's, there's just a lot of activity in general. Has it increased in the last sort of 12 months? I mean, obviously, obviously there, was a, there was a feeling that the world stopped or slowed down at the beginning of yeah. lockdown. Did you see a, a dip in the number of businesses that were actively put on the market for sale or has that just been continu- continually to increase over that time? Yeah, the, the market completely dipped. Like the, during the COVID, uh, everything had stopped for the two, three months. But starting now, since we're actively getting engagement out of, out of the COVID, uh, things are going off the chart. Um, you know, you have, the, you have the, some of the businesses who are, have not done as well during COVID. You have others who are doing phenomenal uh, because of COVID. But in, in any case, everybody got a reali- realization that exit has to happen at some point in time. Because you know, most of the sellers that we deal with are uh, you know on on a sixty five years old and up um, uh, scale. So uh, there's yeah. definitely a, an increase of activity in the past three three months. We're we're been really really busy. Yeah, um, and just and just to sort of um, unpack that a little, people, because one of the things uh, unpack that for people. Sorry, one of the things we did say um, in announcing this webinar was you know what is the opportunity and why does that opportunity exist. So I'll talk a little bit about that now for everyone who's listening in. So, so if you are a small business owner or you want to acquire a business as opposed to starting one, they tend to be the two types of people who enter this world. Then what you've got happening right now, and it's been publicized quite extensively in um, media, media outlets such as Forbes uh, and others, that you have this, this big shift, if you like, of baby boomers retiring. Now, just to just to kind of again unpack that a little bit for people, because people have to understand exactly what this means. So, if you if you look at someone like Richard Branson, he has built his whole empire, his whole Virgin Empire, if you like, off the baby boomer generational shift. So even now, there's talk of him moving into investing in retirement homes, uh, because he's literally ridden the wave you know, all the way through to kind of, you know, investing more in higher in travel and, and obviously those sort of things. So, so as a, as a kind of uh, a wealth um, ownership, if you like, or where wealth is being situated for a number of years, it's been across this baby boomer generation. Now, as, as they reach retirement age, which by the year 2030, all of the boomers will have reached 65 years of age, you've got a massive transfer of wealth. So a lot of them are business owners, a lot of them are wanting to therefore retire, are wanting to close down their businesses, sell their businesses, do something else. You've got a lot of capital that is sitting within businesses, good profitable businesses that needs to go somewhere. And this is what I, I encourage a lot of people who, who I work with and, and clients, et cetera. If you've got a business now that's doing well and you're looking to grow organically, well, growth through organic means is only gonna get you incremental gains. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Of course, you wanna you know, have sales and marketing working for you. You wanna be able to you know, win customers, move them through your business, make, make revenue, make profit. But one of the things we talked about was you, know, you can literally buy competitors, buy suppliers, maybe even buy your customers. And that can increase the size of your, your business exponentially. So one of the things to take away from what we talked through this evening or today, if you're listening to this on um, the other side of the world in the US, is you know, have a look at your business model currently and, and start to look at both you know, your competitors, supply chain customers, and see if you have anyone who is reaching retirement age or is at retirement age, 60s or 70s year, year of age, and are looking you know, potentially to exit. Now, they might not have their business for sale on the market yet, 
but it's an opportunity for you to open up a conversation, particularly if you already have a relationship with that individual. Okay, so it's incredible what can happen. Now, I've worked in a number of different industries around this, mainly professional services. I worked with a PR group a few years back that did seven acquisitions, and three of those acquisitions were focused very much on people reaching retirement age, the business owners. And in one of those situations, the, the business tripled its revenue within about an 18-month period just through an acquisition strategy. Okay, And that was before we're starting to see this pull through of, of the generation change. So I'll, I'll stop there. Rob, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I just think the, the scale shouldn't be underestimated. There's 2.3 million businesses that employ over 25 people um, that, um, that, that you know, falls into this category. That's in the US. That's in the US. And these business owners, understandably, they've been such a pillar of the communities that they've served, they can't envisage any other lifestyle than running their business. And they just keep kicking the can down the road. And there comes a time when they're just going to have to be confronted with reality, which is you just can't do this forever. Uh, there's no management buyout on the table. There's no second generation that wants to inherit the business. Uh, and you know, people need to put their arm around them and, and give them another option, which is why this presents such a great opportunity for individuals that want to pursue acquisition entrepreneurship. Yeah. And that's, it's, it's, it's an interesting point also in terms of, um, so what happens, right? So if someone is at that retirement age and they've got a good profitable business, what are their options? Okay. So, and this is an important point because we advise that you look for this as well. There may not be a natural successor because the children or even the grandchildren, if you like, of, of these individuals just may not be interested in picking up that business. You know, they may want to go off and be you know, YouTube celebrities or something, right? So, so in that situation, if your main motivation is, you know, I want to go and do something else with my life, I want to go and travel with my, my uh, partner or whatever else, then the main motivation for selling that business may not necessarily be the money that you're going to make. Now, of course, if you've spent 30 years in a company, you want to realize the value of that time investment. But a lot of the businesses that we get exposed to, either through brokers and, and relationships like with Dennis or direct, the main motivation is usually something around freedom. And so what that means is two things, is if valuation or, or the, the cash coming out of the deal isn't the main motivation, you can get these businesses at very, very good prices. Um, I would say right now, I've never seen the market so devalued that it absolutely is an opportunity for buyers like I've never seen before. And what that means is if you're looking at a good profitable business, you're looking to buy the business for somewhere between two to four times its net profit or its cash position. Okay. And that's pretty impressive when you think of how you can then repay that back from the profits of the business over time. It means that you're not having to, you know, keep working and growing that business to pay back any liability that you have for buying that business. And in some cases, depending on the motivation of the seller, you can do deals which are effectively all seller finance. And I'll get into some of these terms a little bit later on. So you're not putting any of your own cash into the table. I have seen deals done and they're rare where businesses are more or less given away for a piece of the upside. Now, you would ask the question, why does that happen? Why would someone give away their profitable business? You know, might be turning over seven figures for nothing. Well, because... The motivation to leave, like they, the, the person selling the business might be sick, their partner might be sick. There could be all sorts of different life changes happening that, you know, there is more motivation to go and do, as I said, something else than it is to hold on to that business. So this may sound crazy to a lot of people who are hearing this for the first time, but this is what the market is like. And if anything, it's accelerated in the last 12 months, particularly because of COVID. And just to, again, draw a line under that, the reason for that is because a lot of people who are, as I said, at retirement age, they don't want to go through another growth cycle. They don't want to have to pick the business up that might have been depressed or the revenue might have dropped. They wouldn't want to have to go through that again. It's a tiring process to do that at any time. It's particularly tiring if you've gone through that transition and you're you know, a little bit older, et cetera, et cetera. So, so we'll go through how to do this so people get some value. But as I said from the outset, please post any questions you have around some of the stuff that we're covering today, tonight, uh, into the chat, and we'll make sure that we um, stay on the webinar and cover all the questions before um, the session's finished. Okay, so quite a few things to sort of unpack there. Let's, let's get into um, 
some of the principles. I want to get into specification. I want to get into deal origination and some of those things. Before we do that, guys, is there any other perspectives that you want to share just high level uh, about the market, about any trends that we're seeing right now that can help people who are listening in today? Um, I'll just... Go ahead, well, I was just going to say, I think that there are a number of factors in the marketplace that make this a very attractive time to get into buying businesses as well, post-pandemic. Um, and I think, you know, low interest rates, PPP loans, um, other government assistance has really helped fuel acquisitions for entrepreneurs to be able to take advantage of those conditions. So even though it might seem like a strange time, the M&A market is, is booming. Um, and uh, this presents the opportunity to the sellers uh, to sell now as they may not get another chance. And we're increasingly seeing the advisors of these, uh, these baby boomers making sure that they've made proper provision in terms of preparing their business for sale. So there are now more professional services individuals working with business owners with their retirement planning. Because like I said earlier, there is not a great deal of time left. So a lot of the time when you see a business for sale, uh, it may well now be that they are starting to think about it. So you don't need to persuade people to sell their business. It's coming closer to the front of their mind. So it's a really good opportunity with, with all of those factors in the market I just mentioned. Okay, good. I'm going to go through a live opportunity that we have on the table in a second as well, just to show how that works. Um, Dennis, you had a couple of things to add. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll just add, you know, I've been, I've been doing the business transactional piece uh, as a broker for the past six, six plus years. Uh, it has never been easier to talk to sellers, to prospective sellers. It's, it really became an easier conversations to have. Um, you know, people are more exposed that there are actually options out there for selling the businesses. It's a, it's a much more uh, uh, easier conversation to have nowadays than you know, six, six years ago. And there's so many opportunities uh, from the SBA, from different financing, as Rob, Rob mentioned. Um, you know, I also see uh, those business owners developed a lot of value in their real estate. And there are uh, opportunities uh, I've been seeing that you know, the business owner might really be interested in that retirement income coming from the real estate part. Uh, so there might be opportunities to have a long-term lease and, and have a better strategy on the exit on the business side. Uh, that's one of the things that I've, I've seen in the past couple couple months that you know the real estate has really went up in value uh, and that's where they're holding all their uh, exiting uh, eggs in their basket. Yeah, no, interesting. So, so there you have it. So everyone who's listening in, um, so there's just some of the various dynamics that are out there in the marketplace right now. Um, what I would encourage you to do, I mean, obviously you're here listening to this, you have interest in this space, is, is start to think about how you can just, you know, test this for yourselves. Okay, so first and foremost, go out there and, and you know, as I said, if you're a business owner, do, do a little bit of work just on kind of the ecosystem that surrounds your business. So have a look at the suppliers, have a look at your current customers, have a look at um, competitors and just start to do a little bit of work in terms of, is there an acquisition opportunity there, particularly competitors? Because as I said beforehand, you know, what you can do in that type of transaction is you are really buying the customer list, particularly if the product and service mix is very similar. So if you buy your competitor, quite often you can remove costs from the business you're acquiring and get the full upside, the revenue upside, the, the EBITDA upside, simply from that type of activity. Okay, so let's let's go through this in a bit of sequence, guys, I think for everybody here. So we'll, we'll start off talking about how do you know what to go after? Then I want to go into how do you find deals? And then I want to talk a little bit about some of the, what I call progressive financing options, just so people can understand how that all works. So to kick it off, the first thing you have to really consider is what type of acquisition you want to make. Um, and if this is a first time for you, I strongly encourage you to play in the lane that you're comfortable in for your first acquisition. So what does that mean? You may have interest in, in multiple different types of industries, businesses, sectors, all those sort of things, geographies even. The easiest thing to do for your first acquisition is to buy something that you know. And there's a number of reasons for that. As I said from the outset, it's not just about the acquisition, it's about what you do with the business once you have it. You wanna optimize, you wanna improve, and you wanna create value by what you can do to that business. And we'll get into that a bit this evening. The second thing is, if you are gonna use creative finance or progressive finance, it's much easier to be able to, to get approved for that finance if you have a track record. If you don't have a track record in an industry or sector, you usually have to bring in a partner that does 
to prove credibility to anyone who's going to, um, you know, loan you the money in various ways. And that includes things like SBA loans in the US, which we'll talk about. The other thing, if you're a business owner, obviously it makes sense to play in your lane because your whole goal is to build value quickly through acquisitions, ultimately to, to increase your cash flow, but also to think about creating an exit. And if you can bring together a group created through acquisitions, so your core business, plus two or three other acquisitions that come in, then you have a group structure and that is a very attractive model for a private equity exit. And you can literally buy these businesses for, as I said, between two to four times their net profit, their EBITDA position. But when you create a group, the valuation multiple goes up. So quite often you can buy these businesses. So let's say it's an average of three. You can sell them for six to eight and to 10. The last exit that I was personally involved in was a 14 times EBITDA exit, big private equity exit. Um, and that was 14 separate acquisitions all built together to create a group. Okay. So let's go through here. We got any questions yet, Rob? We're we still going through. No, we haven't. No, I've just put something in the, uh, the chat to say, please let us know where you're based so we can cover any jurisdiction specific information. Um, okay, oh, hi, Rick. How are you doing? Rick's just come in. Oh, good. Hi, hi Rick. Rick's Excellent. Yeah, from California. Uh, we know Rick. So uh, anybody else, please let us know where you're calling from. We'll make sure we cover off any, anything specific to your location. Great. So that specification piece, just to finish my point, then I'll let the guys jump in as well. So you, you effectively have to plan this out, right? So, so first and foremost, have a think about, as I said, the industries that you have competency in that you understand. And the second layer is usually geography. So something that's close by, it doesn't have to be. Uh, we look at deals across the UK and the US predominantly based in the UK, Dennis is in the US, but we look across those geographies because we have experience across those markets. Um, what I wouldn't advise is, you know, first acquisition, go and buy somewhere in Australia where I'm originally from. Great place to holiday, but it's a long way from, you know, a lot of places to get to if something goes wrong, right? So don't do that for your first one. And then the third criteria is where you're passionate about it. Now, again, I'm cautious to recommend this because a lot of people go, oh, I'm just going to go and buy a business that I'm passionate about. I'm going to go buy a boating company in Miami. Uh, don't do that for your first deal. Okay, Have a think about that as something that as you get more experience, you have a bigger network, you have partners that can help you. That's the sort of thing you can move into as what I call, you know, acquisition entrepreneurship as a full-time profession. Okay. Anything else guys on deal specification? How do you decide where you want to play first? Um, I think um, from my perspective, as, as Nick was saying, focus on an area that you have experiences, whether that's a, a spe specific discipline or a sector, it's important that you understand the business for all the reasons that were explained, but also your connections. So if you had connections with supply chain, family, partner, good friends that you might decide to go into uh, to business with as well, um, that's certainly something that's, that's worth considering. But the majority of you that are here now, uh, my understanding is, is that you're looking to buy businesses to be able to increase your assets, and your customer list and your revenue um, within the sector that you're playing in. So be really, really clear about your definition. So the sector, the location, um, the type of business in terms of where it's located, not, not in terms of the jurisdiction, but does it have five or six different offices or is it just one central headquarters? What level of coverage does it have? Um, and also how mature, how advanced are they? Uh, do you want to take over a business that, maybe has done nothing to improve digital marketing, has very little social media presence uh, because you have that skill that you can bring to be able to accelerate that? Or are you looking to kind of inherit a business that's more mature with some of those processes? Uh, also size. So clearly the level of profit is going to determine one, potentially what you're able to finance, but two, the overall amount of money you're going to have to pay for the business and their enterprise valuation. So there are a number of variables that you need to consider but in the same way that we advise marketing, niche down. Try not to go too wide and be really clear about your intent. So you're in your market, you want to buy businesses that look like this, be known for doing that, and you'll tend to find opportunities will, uh, will come to you. And Dennis will answer for me as well, but when I go to brokers with a very, very clear one-pager with my ideal target deal specification on it, brokers are very, very helpful and will sometimes proactively source businesses because they know I'm a serious buyer. Dennis, is that something that you prefer as a broker? That, that's that's absolutely like having a good focus, uh, but being open-minded as well. I, I see a lot of first-time buyers 
concentrate on the revenue size. This is the revenue size that I want. This is the cash flow that I want. Um, it's, in my opinion, probably not a good idea to just be a concentrating on a particular revenue because you might have a $2 million company that's losing money and you can have $500,000 making $250,000 a year. Um, so have a little bit of a broader uh, ranges on your revenue targets, but be precise into what your experience in the industry is and what you can potentially add as a value add uh, on a particular acquisition. Um, but yeah, I absolutely agree with all the points. Okay, great. All right, so let's talk here about the different types of deals that you will encounter. Uh, I'm going to go through a number of different models just so for anyone, I know we've got a blend of different experiences on the webinar tonight. So I'll say oh, hello, Ryan from Ontario. We've got a couple of people who are working with us from Toronto at the moment on acquisitions. So good to have you here. Um, so there are a couple of different things, right? So if you have an existing business, one of the options to look at is what I call distressed deals. And that's where you are looking for a company that is really, you know, very, very cl close to sort of some level of liquidation. You don't want to buy a, a business which has got heaps and heaps of debt, uh, but you may want to set up a structure where you're buying the customer list or you're buying the product IP. You're buying some form of asset in the business because you're going to bolt that business into your core business regardless. So I don't advise anyone to go and buy distressed deals if you're just going to go and fight buy your first business, because quite often you have to go in there and do a lot of, of um, triage and fixing and all sorts of stuff to try and get the business back on track. Now, lots of people that we have worked with love that, and that's what they want to do. They want to go and fix, but it's, it can be hard work. And my advice is to not go to that model as your first acquisition, unless you're buying it and you're going to strip it and then um, slam it into your current company. Okay. So that's a distressed deal. That's where you can hear, you hear these things about, oh, can I buy a business for a dollar or a pound? Quite often they're distressed transactions, okay? The one that we talk about a lot is what is called a leverage buyout. And a leverage buyout is effectively where, you know, it's, it's often, you, often termed uh, no money down deals or um, using other people's money. And what you're effectively doing is you're leveraging various, assets, resources, opportunities, networks, collaboration to get a deal done. And of the hundred or so acquisitions that I've been involved in, I've never paid the price, the valuation of a company all in one hit at the close of the deal. I've never, ever done it. Uh, so even the big deals, the big private equity deals that you hear, it's, it's not that you have to turn up with heaps of money to get a deal over the line. You have to be very, very, again, I'll use the word resourceful about what you can get access to. So let me just unpack this a bit for you and I'll, and I'll put some examples down as well. So in a leverage buyout, you are looking to buy a profitable business, a good profitable business for a reasonable um, valuation. As I said before, let's work on the assumption of three times net profit and I'll go through a specific example. What, what we wanna look at here is we want to look at, okay, we're, we're going to agree a price for this business at three times the profit. How can we now structure the deal so that it's the most favorable for us in terms of risk and reward, but also is going to be amenable enough for the seller to say, yep, I'm happy with that deal. So leveraging simply means that we're going to first look at the balance sheet of the business and we're going to look at the assets that exist in the business and we're going to raise finance against those assets. Now, if the business is very asset rich, so construction companies where they've got, you know, fixed plant material, they've got machines, all those sort of things, you can effectively take a loan against those assets over a 10 year period, sometimes more, sometimes less. One of the ones that we look at um, very closely is receivables. And receivables are probably the most, I'm going to say liquid of all the assets because you can literally raise up to 70 to 80% of receivables on the balance sheet. And you can effectively take that back as cash to put into the deal. Now, again, you are paying that back again over that sort of 10-year period. But if you're buying a profitable business, remember, the business is already generating enough profit to pay back that loan. So all you're doing is trying to create a lump sum of money that you can then give to the seller at close to motivate them to do the deal. But that's coming from or will be paid from the profits of the business over time. The other area that you want to look at is what we call deferred payments or seller financing. And this is a game where you agree with the seller that you're not going to make all the payments up front. You're going to make the payments over a, an agreed period of time, usually around three to four years, 
in regular installments, again, from the profits in the business. So that could be monthly. If someone wants to have a monthly income, let's say, it could be quarterly. Uh, I haven't seen it much more than that, sometimes half yearly, but usually it's monthly or quarterly. And again, if you think about that, you know, you're, you're effectively using those, those profits, as I said. So it's not coming out of your pocket. So what I'm going to do now is just effectively just take you through a deal just so I can sort of hit this home and you can understand exactly how this, how this looks. So let's say, and this is a formula that, that we've used quite consistently over the last few years. So let's say you have a business that is making 400K, so $400,000. And three times that, so three times that net profit is going to be 1.2 million. Okay. Now of that, we want to take 10%. Okay. And that 10%, so that's $120,000. You want to be able to either put that in as cash that you have. Okay. Or you want to get an investor on board. Or you want to be able to, and I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, in the SBA loan world, Dennis, 10% is the amount of capital that you have to put into a deal. Uh, 10% is the minimum amount that you'll need to put in the deal. And the bank will require the seller to, to uh, carry the, uh, the other 10%. Is that right? Uh, okay. Seller financing. Fine. We'll talk about anything, but, but the point being is that 10%, right? You know, that's, you might say 120, I haven't got $120,000, but if you've got a business, you can probably work out how to get access to that, or you can bring someone in to get it. So there, so I don't, when I say no money down deals, they're not what I would call people who go out there and say, oh, every deal is a no money down deal. Don't believe that. It can happen, but it's rare. It's the exception. You are looking at a small amount of capital, but right now that 10% is all that you're going to be finding for the deal. The other 90% that can be funded by alternative markets like invoice, asset, revenue lenders, all of those sort of things. Okay. So the way to think of this is you're going to be buying a business that's worth 1.2 million, but your capital outlay is going to be about 120 grand. Now I've already said the business is doing 400 K at the moment per year in profit. So just think about that for a second. So you're going to be paying off some of that as deferred payments, some of that as assets. You're still going to probably be taking home half of that as profit that you have, as you can take as a dividend, you can take as an income, depending on what you want to do, or you can invest it back into more acquisitions. And that model, that leverage buyout model is the model that we recommend because A, there's a lot of opportunity to be able to leverage alternative finance right now. Okay, Dennis, I'll hand over to you because I know you've got a lot of experience in that space. Anything you want to add to that? Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I haven't had a, a deal. I don't, actually, I had one deal that all, all of the funds were due at closing. That's extremely rare. Uh, there's always, there, there's always uh, something that is paid over time or, or, or seller financing or not. It's, an, it's expected from both the buyers and the banks. Banks want to make sure that the seller is also uh, on the hook uh, yeah. for, for some percentage of it. And, you know, the, the SBA guidance on SBA is very, uh, thin, uh, it's individual banks that some, you know, add on their own individual, uh, uh contingencies up on, on top of it. So just, you know, you got to make sure you're working with the right bank as well on that, but, uh, yeah, it, I absolutely agree. Okay. And the, and the other one that's, that's quite common also is effectively an equity share position. So if you're going to buy, uh, let's say you're going to buy a competitor, you might um, agree that you're going to have a valuation of their business, a valuation of your business, and then effectively there's a share percentage. So particularly this works if you've got bolt-on acquisitions that are going to move towards an exit. Happens quite a lot in the media game. You're, you're effectively swapping shares. So someone, a smaller business that you buy in, you're going to give them a bigger share of the entire um, entity or a share of the entire entity. And then when a capital event is realized for the bigger entity, that's when the main payday comes in for that, that person who you're acquiring. Quite often though, and I'll just say this in those deals, there is an expectation of some cash, a bit of cash. But again, in those sort of situations, um, you're, they're buying into the growth strategy. They're buying into the fact that the, the one plus one is gonna equal three or 11 or more, or whatever it is, because scale matters, right? And scale matters more now than ever. Okay. And um, we've got quite a few people joining now I'm noticing here as well. So again, uh, just to, to be super clear, uh, any questions you have, post them into the chat and we will break and talk about uh, anything that you want to cover uh, outside of the content that we're going to deliver tonight. 
Okay. Um, so, and the other thing I think I just put this out there just because I know there's a few people here who are thinking about this as a, as a more entrepreneurial play. You can consult for equity as well. Uh, if you have a coaching consulting business and you want to kind of build equity stakes in businesses, you can do it that way. Um, that's, that's nothing wrong with that at all. And you can also broker for others. As I said, the opportunity around acquisitions right now is quite big. So there are a lot of people out there looking for expertise within acquisitions and M&A just to be able to add that capability to what they're trying to do for their own growth story. Okay, anything else, guys, on LBOs or distressed deals that you guys want to jump in on? Yeah, all I would add is, as well as how you're going to fund and finance the deal, there's also those elements of the two levers, enterprise valuation and adjusted EBITDA. So when the profit is presented to you, there are a number of different factors. When you get into the balance sheet and you look at the consistency of revenue, that might make you challenge or reduce your valuation. So you mentioned two to four times, absolutely, Nick, but there'll be certain factors that would make you think it's a two, and that could be fluctuation in revenue. It could be the quality of the accounts, so they haven't been done by a big five accountancy firm, and they've been done by a local bookkeeper. Uh, there's too many zeros in there, they don't look too precise, then that's gonna make you think that this is gonna be a lower valuation because there's potentially some, some more risk there. Equally, you've got to look at the working capital of the business and the amount of working capital that you need to be able to maintain delivery to achieve those profits. Um, and, and also, you know, if the business is in decline, there's going to be some expense that you're going to incur, which you're going to need to bring to the deal, um, which you should also take out of the valuation, as well as replacing some of the time that the owner might have been spending in there by bringing in your own general manager, which I know you're going to talk about later on. So the other two levers we really need to be mindful of are what is the adjusted EBITDA? So the new profit position that you think you're going to be in having made those adjustments and also recognizing where there is risk in the deal that would make me want to start to reduce the multiple. But clearly, rapport is everything in being able to get the seller to show flexibility to you. So there's an appropriate time to be able to introduce these kind of, uh, um, I guess, uh, feedback to the seller um, in how you describe your current position of how you value the business. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just add that it's, it's just as much of a relationship uh, business as a transactional. Don't concentrate on it's spending all of your time in negotiations on the numbers. It's, it's as much of a relationship business as it is a transactional one. Um, Probably more so, yeah. Dennis, isn't it? I mean, I think, you know, a lot of it's we, we talk about the, the superpower here is the ability to build relationships and build rapport. It's, it's absolutely true. Um, you know, it, it, money is not is money is not uh, the number one on the list. Uh, it, it's, it never it never is. Um, absolutely. All righty. But I mean, there's there's so many opportunities, so many opportunity for financing. Um, just you know, uh, the valuation is is really determined um, based on the risks and the risk of the company. I would just say that you know when when you're looking at the deal, don't include in your valuation the opportunity that you can bring into the business look at the value strategically on what those cash flows currently that are producing in this business. And don't think about, you know, I'm going to add this, I'm going to do this. Think about it as of right now. The valuation is a, is a snapshot of historic performance and not of, a, of an opportunity basis. That, that's your equity uh, as a buyer. You, you, I think what we'll do now is just bring in the importance of what the deal team looks like. So we'll get into some deal origination, deal sourcing in a second. But one of the things you've got to um, take into consideration here, as I said, the opportunity is people who have businesses that are reaching retirement age. I, I would say focus there, particularly if you want to get the best deals uh, for all the reasons that we've said. Now, you've got to appreciate that a lot of these businesses are not that progressive when it comes to their marketing and sales activity. A lot of the ones that we've looked at, some we've walked away from, some we've acquired, uh, have very, very poor marketing. They, they haven't even got websites that work very well. Uh, they've relied on word of mouth. Uh, some of them even go out there and literally put, you know, things in letterboxes, <laughs> pamphlets. Um, but they've got brands, right, that have existed in that in their local geography, in their local communities for years. And there's value in that that's not necessarily demonstrable, if you like, or demonstrable in the balance sheet, right? So, so you've got to look at that and think, okay, well, it's already got a good product. It's got a proven model. It's got good foundations. It's got profit. What can I do to optimize? And if you've come from, let's say there's a few of you who are currently employed and you're thinking about acquisition entrepreneurship 
as an opportunity to increase your uh, assets, your net asset, then you know you could be looking at this saying, well, okay, I've been a marketing director or a sales director or an ops director or whatever it is in a corporate world for 20 years. How can I buy a under-leveraged profitable business and bring in my expertise to improve it? So my background before I got into this space um, and certainly before I got into the private equity space was marketing. So I, I can go into these companies and look at their brands, their propositions, look at what their current acquisition strategies are. And Rob is very strong on conversion. His background is, is sales. So, so we can go in there and look at the sales and marketing efforts of these businesses and we can often improve them. Very rarely have we seen a business that's the sort that we're talking about here that has everything you know, really joined up and it runs like a well-oiled machine. So to Dennis's point, you're not paying for that value. You're paying for, for the brand asset, the, 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 the community, the loyalty, all the stuff I just mentioned. You're not paying for what you can do to it. And just by you know investing in Facebook ads, for example, building a better website, doing a bit of social media, you know, um, engagements and marketing, building you know a list that you can then you know have uh, different offers going to, all of those things are going to increase the revenue in the business, the value in the business that you can add to it later on when you come in. Okay, so that's just something to keep in the back of your mind as well, which also de-risks the fact that you're doing this because you're buying something that is. And I wouldn't say it as directly as this normally, but I'll, I'll put it out there, that is successful despite of all the opportunities that it could be doing. Okay. So your deal team, just to kind of get onto that, is first and foremost, you've got to think about your role. Are you going to be an owner investor or an owner operator? Uh, quite often, um, if you have an existing business, you, you, know, you might be the CEO of that business, the founder of that business. You know, you're going to bring this in and perhaps you're just going to run the whole thing. You might, you know, have to employ a few more people or bring some people in from the business you're acquiring, you know, to run that as sort of a unit within your group. But ultimately, you might be the owner operator. Uh, most acquisition entrepreneurs, the stuff that Rob and I do and Dennis does are effectively owner investors. So one of the key criteria when we're looking for our deal specification, is there a number two in the business? Is there a general manager, an ops manager? It doesn't have to be as as glorious as like a CEO, a real strategic person. We need someone who can run the machine. And quite often we're looking for someone who knows the business, knows the customers, has been there for a period of time, is happy to stay on. You can incentivize them with a profit share or equity and you want them to effectively just make sure the thing delivers to the plan, the revised plan, the growth plan that you're gonna put into that business. And that's how you can have multiple investments. So we've got a couple of, uh, businesses we're looking at, at the moment. I'll go through one in a second. Uh, we've got a couple that we've exited. So we're always looking around five to 10 that we have investments in at any one time, but we're all of them, every single one of them has that sort of number two, that general manager, that ops person who's running the machine for us on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. So that's the first piece. The other important components of your deal team to get these transactions over the line, you need a good CPA, a good accountant, ideally someone who has an understanding of corporate finance, has an understanding of that type of, of activity. Uh, you want a really good lawyer. Okay, again, someone who understands corporate law m and because two things are important there. The deal has to be put together by a lawyer, but also they are going to be looking for any skeletons in the closet, as will the CPA. But those two are the fundamental cause of your deal team. And then I'll go back to what I said at the very beginning of this webinar if you are going to buy in a sector that isn't something that you've got experience with, you might have to bring someone in who has got experience in that sector to be another partner in the deal. But quite often the deals that we do, we have minimum of three, maximum of about five that are part of the deal team. And depending on what's happening, we just split the equity. So it's better to have a small percentage of something than have you know, a bigger percentage of nothing. And so it's important to have that right deal, that right team around you to get the deals done. Okay, so I'll pause there. Anything I've missed on that, guys? I think I've covered the majority of it. No, I think we've covered everything on the uh, on the deal team. Um, like you were saying, Nick, I think getting people with the right experience uh, is essential. Um, yeah, you know, if you pay for the best people out there to support you in this, you're going to get a better result. So try and identify individuals that have experience of doing the type of M and A that you're looking for and the size and the face off to the equivalent deal team on the, uh, on the other side as well. Um, 
there are lots of networks out there, people you can connect with uh, in this world who always have good recommendations. And, and Nick and I have a, a Rolodex, although that sounds like quite an old fashioned word. Now. <laughs> it does. <laughs> but we do have a black book, a black a book, black book for, yeah, a telephone directory of uh, really good people that will help with the three key elements. So, as Nick said, a lawyer, an attorney, a CPA or accountant. Uh, and, and probably most importantly, an asset financing firm that you can trust and you know yep. that will kind of get you the best deal. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and having a network of people who can who can bridge that finance is important. We'll get into that in a bit more detail when we do financing in a sec. Yeah, okay, Dennis, I was just gonna, on that? Yeah, I was just going to say having the right people on your on your team is 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 the difference between making the deal and losing just waste wasting time. Um, you having the attorney or uh, CPA who've done these transactions before can serve you not only as a, as a great team member, but also a, a proper way of sourcing deals as well. Uh, I would advise if you are an operator type of person who is going to be operating the business, might be a good idea to get pre-qualified with an SBA, uh, just so you can have some kind of a, a paperwork on hand uh, that's showing that, that you are credible and have a backing of a bank behind you. Um, yeah, very good. All good points. Okay, so let's get into some origination. This is usually the hottest question that we get through any of um, the programs that we run, any of the mentorship. Uh, Nick, and... we've, had a, we've had a couple of people post some things in the chat, so I okay. just want to refer quickly to that. Um, so I asked which sectors um, the attendees are in. So Rick's come back and he's prepared food delivered. Ryan yep. is real estate sales and marketing. Um, Charles is based in Southeast United States. Hi there, Charles. Um, and his specialist area is apartment buildings and mobile home parks. And he's got a shopping center with a good anchor tenant. So that gives us a kind of appreciation of the types of sectors that uh, they might be looking in. Yeah, well, let me let me add a little bit of, um, I think, uh, thoughts on, on that. One of the areas that is a very successful strategy is is looking at where you are investing money right now. And instead of investing money with external agencies or suppliers, have a look if you can build a services group. So for example, if you have investments, you, if you had a real estate firm, let's say, as opposed to just investments in real estate, you know, acquire any of the suppliers that you're currently using and have them as, as you know, assets, if you like, within a group. So it's, it's what we sometimes call turning defense into offense. So what is your biggest cost becomes actually something for you to create revenue from. Um, the shopping center piece there as well from Charles, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, again, mobile home parks, interesting. Who are the suppliers that you're currently paying to help you run those entities? You know, one of the big areas that Rob and I are looking at right now is uh, corporate cleaning or commercial cleaning companies and security businesses, huge. So again, in a shopping center, do you need that, right? For example, just throwing those ideas out there because sometimes people think, oh, I've just got to buy what I've currently got. That's fine, but have a think about some of these more left field a little bit more kind of interesting ways of thinking about your acquisition plan mm. i think from ryan's perspective anybody that's involved in in landscape gardening with real estate or property maintenance yep. really good complimentary rick prepared food delivered maybe logistics companies people that are operating kind of white man delivery um services so yeah i think that complimentary services companies is a really really good approach to building out your assets I'll give a, I can give an example. Uh, I worked with a landscaping company and the biggest problem of landscaping company was, well, I have a season and then what do I do the rest of the year? Uh, and what we did was uh, we found them a heating oil delivery company, which ex had exactly the same issue. They were ah. only working during the winter. Uh, so not only was it the perfect match, but also the equipment could be used for both ways. So that, that just yeah, kind of a open... Yeah, that's I love like that. A big, big, big view point here. No, very good. No, exactly. That's a, exactly. Look, look for where there are synergies, as we would call them, but sometimes those synergies are just thinking logically around, you know, the type of capability that you're acquiring, the products and services you're acquiring, and how you can combine them together to get that one plus one equals three. Save costs, increase revenue, make more money. Okay, so I'm going to go into deal origination. I'm going to talk about three strategies here, the, the, the three most popular ones. Um, the first one is, is quite simply just direct, what we call the direct approach. And I will unpack uh, an example, as I said, about one we've got currently and how that's working, an off-market deal. 
But a direct approach is, you know, again, you're just going to go and ask, right? You can build a machine around this too, but you're going to have your target list. You've got your specification and you are going to, um, you know, use uh, researchers, VAs uh, to effectively go out there and, and approach businesses, companies that fit within your specification. So within that, there are a number of intermediaries which are quite important. So we find that accountants, CPAs, lawyers again, and wealth managers, financial advisors, are some of the richest uh, intermediaries, if you like. And of course, brokers fits into that too, but that's an obvious one. I'm talking about the left field ones because quite often, particularly the accountant, CPA, and the wealth manager, if someone's 65, 70 years of age and they're thinking of selling their business, the first person they often go to for advice is one of those two roles. Quite often they go there before they tell their wife or their partner, right? Like, oh, I'm thinking about selling the business. How do I do it? So if you can build a relationship with those intermediaries and position yourself as a deal maker, a buyer, an acquirer, quite often, and you build rapport there, you can get deals, off-market deals given to you quite early stage, Okay. Uh, of course, you can go direct to companies. As I said, you can go in the UK, you can look at things like Companies House, where it has a list of all the directors, it shows their age, it shows their home address or the address for the companies listed, and you can write a personal letter. I find that approach does work, but it can be a little bit laborious. And quite often, you need to do a lot of it for it to work. You're better off going into networks where someone is already known, liked and trusted. And that's where the broker piece comes in very well. So we have a good relationship with Dennis. Okay, we talk about doing deals. We've got some different things in the pipeline. Um, and that's great because, of course, people are going to Dennis and they are talking about wanting to sell their business. So by having that relationship with a broker where you're all trying to kind of do a similar thing, that can work well. So Dennis, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, most of my referrals come from either a financial planner or a CPA. Um, that's 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 where everything is right that's where they're trying to find out and the number of question how what is my value of my business they'll go to their cpa they'll try to understand and um so having those relationships in, in place is, is crucial um to getting a pipeline uh, going so i absolutely agree so just on the direct approach and i'll talk about the, how that looks so you can go to um uh effectively online resources to do your research uh, you can use hoovers uh info usa Mint, Fame, uh, Manta, uh, Due Deal. There's ways of creating lists of businesses in your sector. You can look at locations. You can, again, you can get the details of the owners. And then it's really about an approach, an email, a letter, a personal lit letter. It can be typed, but hand signed is quite powerful, particularly if you can get it to someone's home address because it's not what normal people normally expect. And in that, you want to position yourself, as I said, as someone who's doing deals, but you also want to... Uh, potentially say why you're interested in that business. It might be doing something great. It might have won an award. It might have certain customers. You want to show that you've got intent and interest. You're not just sending out a blanket letter. And the more that you can build rapport by showing that you have done the work to so that you have value in someone's business is going to go a hell of a long way in getting them to want to reach back out. Quite often in this approach, you might be the it might be the first time someone's approached them. And so, you know, straight away, you're in the driving seat then because they're not thinking, well, you know, I'm going to get other people out there representing me. I'm going to get into a bidding war with other, other buyers. I mean, that may happen, but being the first person who's shown intent and shown interest goes a long way in getting a deal over the line. Okay. So that's the first area. Um, general networking, I've kind of mentioned a little bit between the intermediaries, but one of the first deals I did when I left the, um, the world of private equity was done in a cafe in my local village. Uh, I know uh, other deal makers who have done literally deals on golf courses and how that's come about is again, by going out there and saying, I'm in the market to buy a business. I'm looking for a business like this. This is what I'm trying to achieve. And it's the old adage, you know, if you don't ask, you don't get. So by just going out there and that could be the dinner party pitch that you give, you'd be surprised how the ripple effect of that can go. So the, the cafe example I just mentioned I know the owner of the cafe. I mentioned I was looking to buy businesses. He then mentioned it to someone else. He overheard a conversation. Um, I've, I've also heard it work in barber shops and hairdressers. Same principle, right? People talk about stuff. And as long as you're positioned yourself as being someone who's in the market, then, you know, again, 
you've got to make it part of your narrative, make it part of your story, make it part of your job title if you want to. Like I'm the owner of this business, but I'm looking to grow through acquisitions. I'm looking to buy businesses and that stuff will go a long way. The third area, which is um, the one that we have had the most success with is through social media. And again, my background being marketing, Rob's very proficient at that as well using LinkedIn, using Facebook. Obviously, I have my podcast. I talk about deal making all the time. We get a very, very strong funnel of opportunities coming in. And you have to think of this, any of those different strategies that I've provided today, you have to think of it like a funnel. You know, deal making is first and foremost a numbers game. Don't expect that you're going to be having one to two conversations and those deals are going to close. Quite often, it's 20 to 30 conversations that might be happening at any one time with the expectation of closing two to three deals. Now that may sound not great, but you've just got to set it up as a process. And you've also got to remember that you need to have the power to walk away from deals that don't suit you. It's often called deal heat or <clears throat> getting emotionally attached. You want to take the emotion out of this. And by having multiple deals, exactly like a sales pipeline, if you've got multiple deals that are going through some sort of vetting or qualification process, then you are going to be setting yourself up to be able to show up in the right way to be able to get these deals over the line. You don't want to be needy. You don't want to be desperate. All of those things are just going to be creepy, right? And you don't want to pay uh, more for a business than what it's worth. You want to have the ability to be able to walk away. And you'd be surprised if you have a pipeline like that, 20 to 30 deals, you're constantly, you know, it's a constant thing and you're always filling up the pipe. Then deals that you've walked away from because the seller thought they could get a better deal, right? Don't be surprised if they come back three to six months later. You know, the statistic is full on of, I think it was the 2019 figures. So pre COVID biz by sell numbers, something like one in 11 listed um, businesses actually sold. So I think that's right. Dennis, is that the latest stat? And there's probably more updated. Yeah, that, no, that's, that's pretty much it. So one in 11. So you've got to say what happened to those other 10 businesses? Well, they got closed down. They got absorbed. Something happened, right? but that's a cost to the owner of that business. So you showing up there and being bold, being respectful, but also being confident in your ability to get a deal done means that you are going to get these businesses on favorable terms. Okay. So I'll pause there um, just to remind everybody, if they have questions, they can post. <laughs> uh, and just to go back to my colleagues here to say, again, is there anything else that you would want to add to that? Um, I would just add something in, in the networking uh networking something i've always found to be a really powerful way of making the right connections so somebody we're working with at the moment in partnership is very interested in buying wineries so she's planning trips to wine growing regions she's arranging to meet with the lawyers she's arranging to visit the vineyards uh and that's and she's doing lots of research into the uh, the industry so that's a really kind of powerful way, you know, buying tickets for the balls, going to the round table clubs, hanging around with what I would call the movers and shakers of the local community. As Nick said, be open, explain what it is you're doing, and people will often come to you with those answers. Um, thinking about where wealthy people in the areas that you're targeting, whether geographic or sector wise, uh, is really important. So if you're targeting a particular sector, and there's a conference uh, that is focused on that sector, but there's kind of platinum club uh, areas that you have to pay to get into, or there's balls or dinners uh, that are more exclusive, pay the money. Pay the money, get access, meet the individuals that are either going to lead you to the deal or be the potential people that you're going to buy their business from. Nick and I have also had a lot of success from a geographic point of view, local sports clubs. So ice hockey, basketball, um, American football, baseball in the USA, rugby, cricket, and, uh, and football in the UK. There's always a bar. There's always somewhere exclusive that you can pay for. You can get the most expensive seats. Most of the local business owners will be in there that are more successful. Um, and when you start getting chatting after a few drinks, they'll lead you again to those, those kind of deals. Uh, Nick and I spent a great deal of time about 10 years ago when we were involved in um, M&A for, for large hotel chains, uh, places like um, Dubai Harbour Hotel Bars. 
and hotel bars in five-star hotels in London and uh, yacht clubs, you know, cows. There's a massive event in the Isle of Wight because we know that there are people there with money and we're going to get introduced to investors and we're going to get introduced to people that want to sell their businesses. So don't underestimate the power of the network. And you may need to almost go through a personal transformation yourself. And you may not see yourself hanging around in those places. But you have to think about, you know, the areas that you spend time in, the people you spend time with. If you can push your way up to dealing with high net worth individuals and movers and shakers and people of influence, that's an excellent way of being able to get deals that no one else is going to get access to from an investor point of view, which we'll cover later on, but also a seller. So, you know, for me, networking and connections done through those kind of uh, events and, uh, and situations has been so useful. And I'd recommend it to anybody. Yeah, very good. Dennis? The, the, only, thing that I, the, the only thing that I would add, <clears throat> uh, as we go through, I mean, this is what I do for a living. I uh, constantly try to get more, more leads, constantly trying to get more business. Um, and I, as I train the new brokers, the it's it's not you know the outreach is of course it's important but the money is in the follow-up you need to make sure that you follow up on those letters that you send you follow up on that uh, on those uh, emails that you send there's a lot of follow-up uh for for our office i think seven or eight different touches it takes to get a reaction so that that's a lot of different things that's going uh, going out to the source so don't stop on that one letter uh, if you you found a niche in the business in the region that you like, you know, go out and you know, go get it. Follow up is where the money is. Great. Okay, so what I'm going to do to to sort of finish off um, the the various uh, parts of the, the strategy and the different things you can think about is talk about financing. So it's one of the hottest topics. I've touched a little bit on that today in terms of leverage buyouts. I talked about ways that you can think about that. I just want to go a little bit deeper. Before we do that, I'm just going to talk about. Um, what we do um, in terms of assessing an opportunity uh, and the level of detail that we go into to do that. So we've got uh, three pretty businesses close to, to a deal at the moment uh, that we're working on. And that's a good number that we've got through to the latter stages of our pipeline. As I said, you're looking to close two to three out of maybe a 20 to 30 list. And then we're constantly bringing um, businesses through the pipe. But this is the sort of thing that we look at. So at the moment, we're looking at a security business. We will look at the credit scoring of that business. We'll get a credit report. Uh, and that will provide us with quite a lot of information that we can then uh, think about structuring a deal. But more importantly, about how we start to build rapport with the owner. Now, at this stage, Rob and I have not spoken to the owner of that business but we have within our deal team, someone who is already going out there and starting to warm that business up. So th this has come through about two or three stages into our, into our sort of stage gate, if you like. So we know the shareholding. We know the age profile of the shareholders. Uh, we have the latest accounts. We have uh, the amount of cash. We know the trade debtors. We know the current assets. We know the turnover. We know the, um, uh, the uh, performance, particularly through COVID. So we have quite a lot of, of assessment data that we have before we're going to. Uh, and we also have some notes that have been put together by uh, the person in our deal team who's out there doing the first kind of sourcing of deals. We know that the business runs without the main shareholder being there. Uh, we know that uh, that individual only goes into the office for half a day a week. Uh, and we also know that it, any liabilities that are over that business. So, so again, what we're doing is we're building up a picture of the company at quite a level of detail before we're even going into the rapport build directly. At the same time, because we're starting to get some basic financial information, we're starting to look about look at how we can structure that deal. So we're thinking, okay, is it going to be comb combination of you know, are we going to have to raise any equity? Are we going to have to think about it from, you know, what can we leverage? Is there going to be factoring involved? All those sort of different things. Okay. So it's important to understand that when you're looking at kind of uh, any type of business, try and get as much information first and foremost as you're going through. And that's going to help you a build rapport, but more importantly, qualify in or qualify out whether you want to go ahead with that deal or not. Okay. Um, I think we've got a question that's coming, Rob. I was just see if we jump into that from Ryan. Yeah. How are you getting this information before building rapport with the business owner? Okay, so 
Yeah, great question. So we are we are leveraging some of those documents that I mentioned previously. Um, and just so everyone's aware, you will get access to the recording of this webinar if you want to go back and look at any of the stuff that we've talked about. Um, but we're getting credit reports. So we're getting the financial information. In the UK, we're looking at companies' house data. We're looking at credit information. But as I said, in our deal team, we actually have someone who's responsible for sourcing. So they have a background in corporate finance. They themselves are retirement age, I think it's fair to say. And they're doing the first, what I call rapport build on behalf or Rob and I. Now, you don't have to do this. Remember, we've been doing this for a while. The reason we like that strategy is it builds up a little bit of position and profile for myself and Rob. Okay, so we have someone who can build rapport, same age, very strong experience, uh, and then presents us as, as obviously the people who want to make the acquisition happen. Now, you can do that yourself. Don't feel you need to set it up like us. But we have someone who does that, so it actually leverages our time more effectively, and we're only getting involved personally in the stages post that. Okay, so hopefully that covered that, Ryan. Please let me know if you've got any further questions in the, um, in the chat. Okay, so asset financing we've touched on. You've got a number of different things you can look at here. So we have the receivables, absolutely 100%. Look at the trade debtors. That, that is 100% the place to look first. Look at surplus cash in the business. Quite often, sellers want to get cash out of the business in the most tax efficient way, and there's different ways of doing that. So look at cash in the business as an opportunity to be able to provide for that closing payment. So obviously, when you buy a business, you're, you're often looking at cash-free, debt-free. But quite often, if you don't show up, getting the cash out of the business can, can be quite tricky. You know, there are you know, these different countries. I'm not going to sit here and advise on all of them. But Dennis, you might have a view on this. If you close a business down, is it is taking? There are some penalties in certain countries around that. Uh, I I don't I'm I'm not sure of that. I don't think there's any penalties in the United no, States. No, I, I meant from a tax position and things of capital gains. What's it like in the U.S.? Yeah, the the, the it, it's absolutely taken depending on what the corporate structure is. You know, if it, 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 there's multiple ways. If, if it's an S corp, corporation type S, then that, that's just the pass through that the money passes through. So it, if it's a C corp, then you know you get double taxation as you take that money out during the call. Okay, yeah, because we in the in the UK we had a um, uh, a very interesting uh, position which would still exists. It's called entrepreneurs relief, and for a number of years, if you sold your company, you had a 10% tax liability of capital gains up to a threshold limit lifetime limit of 10 million pounds. That's now increased to, I think, 20%. And quote me on that. I need to look at it again. But the point is, a lot of people were getting a, a disproportionate advantage by doing that. Okay, so then you've got um, fixed assets, as we've talked about. So you've got plants and equipment, and then you've got things like real estate. So that's property, land, if it is part of the deal. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. I particularly don't like doing deals when there's a lot of real estate involved, but again, it's, you know, my, my colleagues may have a different view on that. I sometimes think it can make the deal a bit more complex. Um, any thoughts on that guys? Um, just make sure that you're separating the quality of the business opportunity from the real estate. Don't get blinded by the real estate and the ability to leverage up to 75% of, uh, of asset financing, make sure that the business is profitable even without the real estate included in the deal. So most, most times when you're buying real estate, then the, um, the, the, the seller just wants true market value for it anyway. Yeah, the, the real estate component, the real estate component, um, especially when you trying to understand the adjustments in the EBITDA and discretionary earnings, how much money is the business actually making? A lot of people I know make a mistake of not doing a rental adjustment and thinking that there's no rent involved if I buy the business, you really need to understand what is the actual normalized rent for this particular property. But the property could be, you know, it could be an asset in the transaction. In my, in my experience, you know, depending on what your target is, like if, if you're looking for a longer term of an investment, it could help you get a longer term loan, a 25, 30 year loan, uh, and you might be able to roll some of that business uh, purchase into it. Uh, I think it's case case by case basis, but um, you know, real estate could be good and could be bad and could be very misleading uh, in those uh, cash flow calculations. So be be careful for sure. That's one of the reasons having a good CPA that can kind of point it out is is, is crucial in these transactions. Absolutely. 
So in terms of uh, invest the money, you know, you've got angel investments, you've got private equity, you've got friends and family, as it's called, venture capital. Um, you can do some sort of crowdfunding as well. I tend to advise here that it's good to have uh, investors in your network that are prepared to support what you're doing as a deal maker. Now, if you're, if you've got an existing business and you want to grow through acquisitions, as I said, you can do equity um, share swaps if you like to get the deal done. If it's your first acquisition uh, you can bring someone in who is going to be just the investor. So it's a little bit like buying a property that you're going to um, renovate and then sell on. The intention of that investor coming in is that you've found the deal, you've structured the deal, you're going to run the deal. In other words, even if you're the owner investor or the owner operator, and when a capital event is realized, when the business is effectively sold, then the percentage of equity is, is obviously then shared depending on what the equity split is from that investor. Now, quite often, and this is what I advise, the value of cash to get a deal over the line is quite often considered higher than the structuring of the deal itself. Not always. So if you want to position yourself to bring in um, some form of investor money into a deal, I, I go by the, um, the principle of look at a double equity stake. So if someone's going to give you, let's say back to my example before, the business is worth 1.2 million, you need 120 grand, that would normally be 10%, give up 20% equity. Okay. Now, that means that you're effectively getting 80% of the business, the investor is getting 20%, but the value of cash to get the deal over the line is more important. If you're more comfortable, if you really want to get the deal done, you can even extend that even further because obviously you want the, you know, as I said at the beginning, a percentage of something is better than a percentage of nothing. But just be aware that it's not just going to be usually the, the, the cash value, the investor money value is normally going to be valued higher. Okay. Now that's my principle. But any different perspectives, guys? No, definitely not. I think the value of the uh, the cash at closing um, certainly outreaches um, the uh, you know what might be considered a, a, a fair exchange. So you know, if you've got a good profitable business and you need somebody's help to get the deal done uh, as an investor, then I think you know, be prepared to give up more equity than potentially the percentage of the overall value. Um, that's being provided just yeah, you know, the getting the deal over the line is the most important thing because you've got plans to take that business on and, and grow it um and uh you know i think that's uh, certainly the priority in that situation it, 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 uh, and is it typical is there a typical formula that you guys are uh use to calculate the what is actually the percentage of equity that shouldn't be exchanged for that investment um, I'm, I'm curious myself. It's, it's based on the valuation that we're putting into the business. So as I said beforehand, if the business is worth 1.2 million, the cash injection that's needed is, let's say 10%, 120 grand. We will then do the um, sale and purchase agreement, the shareholder agreement, sorry, um, at a 20% equity stake for that cash investor. Mm -hmm. So that's how we do it. So, so we break it down um, as part of the deal. It doesn't sit on the, um, the, the the transaction side. It sits on the shareholding side post transaction. Yeah, that that, that makes sense. Uh, are, are there any uh, increments of payouts so that the investor get the money first when when that exit happens? Or sometimes I people do ask for that, um, but mm -hmm. you try and mitigate that by doubling the equity position. Yeah. So so you are effectively partners in the deal. Uh, with just different equity stakes. Now, quite often, so if Rob and I are doing a deal and we've got three or four people in our deal team, we're splitting the equity in various ways. So that investor is coming in, let's say, again, to use the example, 20% of the equity stake. You know, I might have 30, Rob might have 30. There might be a split between our other people in the deal team, five here, 10 here. So the deal pie, if you like, or the, or the split of the shareholding is sitting across five or six individuals. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you would, you know, effectively have a board structure around that, but that cash investor may not want to have any real involvement other than just making sure that us yeah. as the deal team doing the deal and scaling it up have the capability to create value. But remember, you, you're, you're working on having these networks in place as you're starting to build your capability. If you're a business owner and you haven't got that, quite often they will bring us in uh, to help position the business for that anyway. So, you know, in, in terms of how you can do that, and we have um, connections within Scale Up Your Business and our, and our consultancy to assist with that as well. Yeah, awesome. Okay. 
So to finish off, we've got a question here. Um, I'm just going to finish off a little bit of this and I'll go back to Ryan's question. Um, so the, the last couple of pieces to look at are seller financing we've talked about. Just to be very, very precise on this, I'm going to talk about seller financing and I talk about earnouts. So seller financing is you have the total deal consideration. You inherit any existing debt in the business. You effectively agree a closing payment, which is not the full price, but then you also agree future payments. Okay. That is structured through, as I said, you know, either cash or raising against asset finance, uh, agreeing seller financing a part of the future payments. And then sometimes, and this is where earnouts come in, you can agree an earnout. And an earnout is a non guaranteed contingent payment that doesn't sit on the balance sheet or anything like that. There's no security against it, but it's essentially a bonus that is paid to the seller based on performance of the business. So if you want to get a sweetener in, if you want to say, listen, we're going to do the deal at this price, but there's also an earnout. It's kind of a separate part of the deal. We're just going to give you a disproportionate payment when the business hits this. It can be a nice sweetener if you want to get that last agreement done when you're in the negotiation. Okay. So I think we're getting close to, to time. I want to, let's have a, look at a question. You want to read out that question from Ryan there, Rob? Are you hiring, promoting, or handing over the new business to the new number two right away? Are you putting that person in place based on the employees that are currently in place? Or do you have someone on your team who sits in that seat during that transitional period and then hires a new number two to oversee it? Okay, so it's all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on a deal by deal basis and it depends on whether you're buying a business outright or whether you are bolting something in. So if you're bolting something into your core business, you might have the infrastructure, the people to run that for you. Um, if we're buying a business, so Rob and I and Dennis as well, I'm sure we're looking for someone who is in the business, who has, who provides stability. And to your point, we don't try and rock the boat on any acquisition straight away. Unless it's something we're integrating into a company where we've, we're confident that we're not going to lose out there, we can just slam it in, as I said before. If we're buying a business standalone, we don't really want to touch that business for the first 90 days. We want to make sure that it's just going to deliver consistency. We want to understand it fully. We may want to go and talk to customers. We don't want to kind of go in there all guns blazing and then you know half the staff leave because John, who's owned the business for 30 years, is like the cultural icon of the business, right? You've got to be very careful. So one of the things that's important about having a number two in the business is they provide that stability. Now, one thing I haven't covered tonight is what types of deals should you be looking for in terms of size? Well, we advise that you should be looking at deals that are between one to $10 million in terms of revenue and normally no less than about 350 to 400 K in EBITDA. Now, I know some people have gone lower than that for bolt-ons and that's all fine because you're just buying the revenue and the profit. But if you're buying a standalone business, you don't want to go lower than that. And the reason for that is that if you go to something that's say generating, let's say 150, 200K of net profit, the risk is that you're buying someone's job. Okay. And that person leaves and all you've done is inherited a job. It doesn't have the size, the scale, the infrastructure for you to then have the resources for you to then be able to run it. So the deals that we look at, let's say a deal that a business that's generating, let's say half a million in um, turnover, it might be generating one and a half to 2 million of net profit. That business is going to have people in it. We, we looked at, we didn't do this deal, but we did look at a fantastic business in Florida that was pre COVID. We love this business. It had two general managers in there, one on the operational side and one on the sales side. And so in that business, it was perfect because, you know, we could effectively keep those guys in place or we could promote one, but the consistency is there. If you find a business that hasn't got someone in place, you then have to either put someone in, in your team, or you bring someone into the deal team who wants to be the owner operator. We've done that a couple of times, uh, or you have to hire someone. Hiring someone fresh that you don't know is a big risk or a bigger risk. One of the other things to consider is looking at doing maybe a couple of deals in quick succession. So let's say you want to buy one, one business in a sector and then another business in a sector. You might buy one business that's already got someone that can run it and then buy a secondary business and then you can put them together like that. So there's things like that. But, but there, there is a risk if you're having to put someone in from scratch, the risk is that it will destabilize the business for a point in time until you can then optimize and grow it again. Okay, so hopefully that covers that. 
Cool. Excellent. Thank you, Ryan. All right. So um, I think we're almost finished on the stuff that we wanted to cover. Hopefully we've we've gone through everything. I think we've covered the trends, why right now is a great time to acquire businesses. We've talked about how to find deals. We've talked about how to finance them. We haven't gone into the detail about what you do after that. But I think for people who are kind of entering this world right now, we've covered quite a lot of the various components. Is there anything else, guys, that I, I haven't covered that you guys want to just quickly add before we finish things up this evening? Um, no, I think that's a very, very good introduction into M&A to grow existing businesses and, and also anyone on here who's, who's looking at uh, acquisition entrepreneurship. Uh, the only thing I would say is it's all of, you know, if you approach this with real intent, then it is very, very possible to be able to achieve results very quickly. Uh, we've seen people work with us and go out and buy businesses within six weeks, uh, a very profitable marketing business. Um, and this, this was a very unassuming guy who, who had a, uh, a software business that was um, being sort of hit quite hard by COVID and schools no longer going on trips. So he used this to pivot very quickly. Um, the last program that we ran, um, somebody has already completed a, uh, a merger of another training business. So the lessons learned and then the ability to be able to go and apply it um, we've seen some some really good traction. Uh, the, the big opportunity, I think, if you own your own business is, is look at when you want to exit, how big you want your business to be, and you'd be surprised by putting the same focus and prioritization on M&A as you would even organic growth. Uh, we'll see you just get further a lot quicker. Um, and something I'm very passionate about, as you are, Nick, having worked as operating partner, and overseeing the acquisition of a number of businesses, um, that accelerated growth and ensuring that that sort of one plus one equals three scenario when you're bolting businesses onto, onto your current business, uh, it's a reality. And it, there's no other way to be able to build asset value value that, that I can think of. And uh, obviously very passionate about it. And if anybody's got any questions they want to add on, I think they're going to get an email inviting them to... Uh, Book a time in with me. Um, I'm very happy to spend some more time talking about this subject with you. Yeah, so put um, for people who haven't um, had a look at our guide on acquisition entrepreneurship, Rob, if you can just add the link to yeah, sure. the chat um, and then I'll wrap things up. Dennis, before I wrap things up, is there anything you want to add to today's conversation? I, I think uh, sometimes people get overwhelmed with the amount of information through a conversation like this. I mean, they're from financing to sourcing, there's so much. There's so there's, there's just so much, and I think for us, we, we break it down like we're, this is a day to day operations. But uh, I, I think you know there's there's definitely your program is definitely one of the best. Uh, I haven't seen anything like it. But there's don't don't get concentrating on financing. Don't get concentrate on the big numbers. And do do the legwork uh, to get to those. Uh, the places uh, do the sourcing and once you in the, once you're in it it becomes more understandable once you start doing it it becomes more of a of a process um, i've done a, i've done a deal recently where a buyer actually took their 401k plan oh yeah convert converted it into without any uh, uh penalties into a down payment and and did, did their first deal that way uh yeah so that, you know, there's, there's so many different ways to sort. I didn't cover the 401k, but you're right. I did have it down here in my notes, but you're right. There is a lot. It's hard to to, to do to run something like this and, and obviously give the breadth of information for people. So I think we've just tried to give you a bit of a, a, a top, top level view, if you like, of what the opportunity is. Um, and a couple of things, I think, you know, if, if you are listening to this and you're looking to sell your business, then definitely reach, uh, get in touch with Dennis, uh, or us, you know, as I said, we're doing deals, but, you know, certainly, um, have a conversation around that. If you have an existing business and you want to learn more about this, we do run a program called empire creation accelerator around this, uh, which is a five week intensive. In fact, the next cohort starts next week. Um, so you're invited to have a conversation um, with us around that to see if uh, it's going to fit you, it's going to work for you. Uh, uh, if you're more advanced, if you have a business that um, really wants to get into this in a really, really robust um, way, uh, then we do offer uh, mentoring and partnering as well, um, where we get involved and actually help you go through the whole process in a more active way, a more hands-on way. So if that's of interest to any of you, then please get in touch. Um, with us, uh, we will send this out, um, as I said, as a, as a recording. So you can look at the recording and look at anything we've covered. 
um, there'll be an opportunity to reach out to us then if you'd like to have a further conversation about anything that we've covered this evening and today. Okay, I think that's it. So thanks to everyone who's who's lasted on this and uh, it's probably going, God, what did those guys cover? There was a lot there. Uh, it's been a pleasure presenting this information tonight. Uh, and yeah, I hope you have a great day, a great evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great being here. Thank you, guys.